All right, here we are. Today we're looking at the novel Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. All right, Willie, what's your first impressions? Uh, first impression, you just called me Willie. <laughs> that doesn't sound right at all. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I really love reading this book. It's uh, yeah. massive. It's got really small font and really thin pages. It's 1,100 pages. We're just finishing up on chapter 5, which yeah. is, I think, about 120 pages. And it just reads so well. Yeah. Her writing style is really, really nice. You get a, a a weird blend of first person and third person, and it's really descriptive in the way she writes her environments and sets up the the setting, I guess. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. I think I was really sold on this book in the first chapter when, uh, what is it, Eddie Willers is walking down uh, late night New York Street and he sees the calendar mounted on the building and it reminds him of a statement that he can't recall and 10 pages later an old man says your days are numbered yeah. and he knows that's the statement that he was looking for but he doesn't remember the context he was looking for it and as the reader experiencing her writing style and the way she threads together all of these different characters and all their experiences it's really fun it's just really enjoyable yeah, and it, it also starts out with the great metaphor when, if you recall, Eddie Willard sees that great big oak tree that he's always admired his whole childhood, right? And then yes, then lightning strikes it at some point, and then he sees that it was completely rotted from the inside. And, you know, that great symbol of pure raw power that he looked up to for his whole life, he realizes... Wow, how, just how weak it actually was on the inside and dead. And I think and she empty. really sets the ground, uh, or sets the stage with that metaphor because, of course, the facade of that tree was it's this powerful, ageless structure that's lived since time immemorial and will forever live. And then finally, it, it's struck by lightning and it, it blows open this uh, revelation for him that actually this thing that he thought was perfect was so far from it and it's completely destroyed and then they go into talking about the economy of America and one of the things I was saying I was talking about this book the other day was it's hard to remember that it's taking place in the 30s yeah exactly it's almost like when I was reading it like I had the sense that it was written in that time era but it's almost like she was projecting some kind of a distant future almost. It feels so relevant. Like the discussions that are going on and the characters that she's built, the, especially um, James Taggart. That's his name, right? Yeah. Yeah, his ideology. His ideology? Idealism? I'm going to go with the word idealism. Really re resonates with uh, some of the stuff that we're experiencing in culture today, and um, I think it's really something you can read at any point in time and really take something away from it because it's a perspective of the world and the realities that people perceive. That uh, when you experience it, you gain you gain insight into how other people sort of operate and what they view as important. Yeah, right off the bat, I noticed that she establishes the di the dichotomy of, you know, progressivism versus conservatism, and she really argues the conservative or libertarian ideology pretty well, so far in a way. And she and presents. And who would you say she's modeling that with? Who? How is she presenting that dichotomy? Would you flesh that out for some of the people that haven't read this book yet? Yeah, it was just. Uh thinking about the second chapter when it's the one that's mainly about Hank Reardon yep and uh when like first of all about that chapter it spends like two pages just describing molten metal and like just the scene it props up the setting so well and it doesn't feel out of place at all another point to make to say that her description her descriptive writing style is really nice but anyway, going forward. It's really vivid, honestly. I, I agree yeah. with you entirely. And it's interesting what light she puts these people in, because I know when we look at James, he's surrounded by yes-men and 
conspiracy driven ideologues that are saying one thing and very much doing another talking about humanity while crippling the men that make the change and you look at hank who's making this metal who's not getting a chance but he knows what he's doing is going to revolutionize the world and then finally dagny taggart gives him a chance not because she likes him but because she needs it and thank goodness he has it because otherwise taggart transcontinental would would collapse without it and that's really interesting that these people who would otherwise have the means of progressing the world aren't in the position to make progress and it's the people that really hold the world back that progress the world certainly in the context of this book yeah absolutely and uh the main part with hank is uh, that i was thinking about was when he was having a chat with his brother i believe his name was phil and his brother was so. tr- his brother was trying to tell him about how oh you big corporations you really should leave some money for the little guy how else is the world going to progress if you know we we leave behind everyone and then Anne Rand as she's writing the book really makes the case that it's all about personal responsibility more than you know the, the comparison of the welfare state to making your own fortune oh absolutely and, and and think- you, you can see how Hank really struggles with that almost when he's talking to his brother who's just a basically you can call him a progressive lefty and he's more of a like he made his own fortune and no one in his life really seems to care or respect that he's the head of a company that's made millions of dollars they just want to they just want to help the little guy and you know spend time with their brother or their family member when everyone is just shitting on him for making his fortune. Yes. I think another character to talk about is someone who we've only just recently in this chapter really been exposed to and had fleshed out, which is uh, Francisco Denconia. Yeah, and he is... I see a lot of similarities between him and Hank almost. Like when I was reading the chapter with uh, Hank and Dagny... The chapter two, I think. I was like, I picked up a little bit of like, okay, these two actually like respect each other and admire each other. Like, almost might be a little bit of sexual tension, but not really. It gets hinted at, but not really. But then when you get to the, the Danconia chapter, hold on. Let me let me just distinguish the two because this is the the stark difference between the two that I saw right off the hop. I feel like, though we haven't had his history really fleshed out. Hank was brought up not being told that he was going to change the world, not being told that he was going to be a success. And he came about it of his own volition and created yeah. this, this great thing. Whereas Francisco was brought up having to earn his name. All of his ancestors increased the profit of the Danconia copper industry. And he almost expected and demanded that he be a success. And now in this fifth chapter, we're really seeing the impact of what that may do to an individual who's been told their whole life and then for their whole life does succeed, how they end up reacting to that wealth and that success and the inverse relationship, what you want someone to learn and the lessons you give them have. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think a bit of the uh, oak tree metaphor was a bit of foreshadowing for chapter five when you see this great, Signor Danconius, and then all of a sudden lightning strikes, and he's just a fidgety guy playing marbles on his rug. And he's just taken his power to a completely different level, and he's abusing it, and he's screwing with people, and he's playing and toying with not just the marbles, but the the members of industry, and he's really pulled the wool over everyone's head with this San Sebastian mine operation that he had going on which has led to the destruction of the phoenix durango rail and ellis elias wyatt is about to uh suffer the consequences of that and i think we're really just about to get into the major plot and i think we're going to see the um story sort of start start to revolve around these key players as we go forward but that we've really just got a taste and the stage like i said is just being set right now 
Yeah. And what a stage it's setting. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's just remarkable. I'm I'm really like I said, I wanted to read two more chapters, but I think that if I had of if we had of we would never have stopped talking because I think it's really going to go into fifth gear here for a little while and uh, steer in some directions we weren't expecting. Mm-hmm. And back to Hank, there's a point where his mother just straight up calls him conceited. Yeah, I don't like that family dynamic. I think it's interesting to watch this character suffer through, whereas I... I certainly could say that if I was in his position, I doubt very much that I would tolerate these ingrateful um, family members that are just, like, I don't see them fueling his fire in any capacity. I don't know why he's interacting with them. And uh, it's, it's an interesting character that Anne's really fleshed out because it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, me either. Like, I really feel for Hank more than... Hank and Dagny, I guess, are probably the two characters I feel the most for. But, like, the worst part about when his mother called him conceited, it was right after he gave his wife the gift of the very first batch of Reardon metal made into a bracelet. And they're just like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Looks like a, well, looks like a it chain, It wasn't eh? even cool. <laughs> it wasn't even cool. It was like you should be getting him your wife diamonds and pearls yeah, and exactly. the, this this thing this whole life's purpose 10 years of his trials and tribulations have led to this moment and they turn it around and they say you're conceited when he was trying to share this experience with them this experience that has brought about their wealth and their state of existence and sustains all of their habits and they just turn around and slap him in the face with it yeah and there's a quote near the end of that chapter where his wife is just holding the the chain up to the light and is just like, oh, look at that. His great success is our chain and shackles or whatever she says. It just didn't, didn't sit well with me at all. And then the entire life's work of someone and all you can see is, yeah, this is what, this is what chains me to him. There's no real emotional connection at all. And I don't know how I would how I would react in that kind of situation. I really don't, because like these are, these are the people that raised you or the people that you were raised with and married, fell in love with, had all these life experience with. And you, you just have to come to the realization that they're not after the same things that you are. And I think that's the insight right there is that their, their values aren't on the same wavelength in any capacity. Yeah, so there's some... There's some good relationship advice for everyone out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to talk for a minute, just kind of the impact reading a book like this has, not so much the content of the book, but the very quest of reading an 1,100-page, tiny script, book, novel, story, in today's age of BuzzFeed. Because it's nice, it's really empowering to, you know, sit there in a waiting room with a book, a Bible of sorts that I pull out and, and start taking another bite off of. And it makes everything else, I think, a bit easier. Once you've re read a book like this, I mean, what could be harder? Like, it's such a commitment. Yeah, and I think a lot of just life in general is just picking up on patterns, pattern recognition. And you pick up a dense book like Atlas Shrugged and you, you go through it, you're bound to pick up something that you're not going to realize you're picking up. It's going to help you somehow. Absolutely. And I think more people should read older books. I love older books um, because I think for some reason authors of the earlier ages had a better notion of what people needed to get out of a book and what it meant to write a novel and there was less to do with sales and profits and more to do with sharing a insightful human experience with the reader taking them into a world of their own design and allowing them to just breathe the ironworks and exhale the perspectives of these individuals and, and get a a new take on familiar experiences 100 percent 
a lot of new literature I find is just a recounting of events and you know the same characters that we've seen on Netflix series yeah absolutely like we've run out of content there's like when you go to make a world a story a novel a video game a show whatever it is you you take a look to the right and you say okay what's my themology which barracks am i pulling my weapons from which mythology am i choosing my characters from and then once you've got that, it's just add water. You have this template where the scenes are already picked for you. The characters, everyone's been introduced to. If it's fantasy and it's got vampires and werewolves and fairies and pixies and things like that, or if it's got gods and slaves and kings, or if it has ninjas and feudal lords or whatever yeah. it is. And most of that stuff is irrelevant because it's, it's the spirit and the meaning of the story that is what is where the value lies. That's what we extract from it. We don't read well, yeah. George R. R. Martin to hear about, you know, dragons, and just dragons, how dragons were and how, you know, how they well, no, breed. And that's where the dialogue really makes or breaks the uh, legitimacy of a, of a writing piece and, and mm -hmm. whether or not it will stand the test of time. Because, like, you can go to the bookstore right now and there's 10,000 brand new novels that are on the number one New York Times bestseller list and they've got all of those things that we just mentioned but there's no substance to it yeah exactly because everyone is reading and watching the same content these days there's not enough diversity and there's not enough going backwards in time there's not enough truly studying what makes literature great most people these days are going to university for four years to learn you know grammar and punctuation and how to structure a narrative in three parts three acts and all that stuff but they're not learning any of the I don't know I, I think I do know where you're going with it because I think what's missing is the core values the story and there's only so many stories when you really get down to it there's the hero's journey um, which is a big one that I'm focused on yeah. right now about battling the dragon and sacrificing a part of your comfort zone to expand your awareness, to be able to have the strength to defeat that dragon, to save the princess, to save the realm, to return to your kingdom. And then what happens when you return to your kingdom is it's not the place you left and your comfort zone isn't so friendly anymore. And you discover that it's now you're revisiting it with new eyes. And, and when you lose the concept of, I need to share with the reader an experience that everyone goes through that they don't even know they're going through and what I think is important about that and why it needs to be gone through and what I think will get them through it so that when they come out of this book at a subconscious level, they've grown as a person. And now you have fun and distracting, and loose cookie cutter BS. And it's really disheartening to look at and see that th this world has expanded, this economy of, of reading and viewing and films, all of these things. There's so much that it's so inflated th that there's no point to half of the stuff that's coming out, and you have to look really hard. And oftentimes I find that I find good, meaningful context in works written by people that are dead. Yeah. I think something that people forget is that when you go out and slay the dragon, that has consequences. It's not just a full reward, there you go, you've done the hero's journey. Bad things come out of slaying the dragon too. Maybe that dragon has two orphans now. Hey, did you ever think about that? That's something <laughs> you could explore. <laughs> That's hilarious. I want to see how long you can run with this. Keep going. <laughs> well, I don't know. That That's just one little example. Like, as you know, I'm attempting to write something myself, and that's just a little, like, once someone figures out that what they need to do, and uh, they figure out their journey and how they need to become a hero, there's going to be points along the way where you realize that you know, maybe you're not the hero that you thought you were. Maybe you turn out to be 
a villain even though you were the best kind of hero available. Well, it's, it's, it's not funny all that black you say and that. white. Can I jump in? Um so if, have you read The Hobbit? Have you watched The Hobbit? I haven't read the books, but I've seen all the movies and I've watched the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay, Lord of the Rings aside, what's captured in The Hobbit is what we, you just brought up is after you slay the dragon, maybe that's not the best thing for it because what happens is when you have this dragon or this existential crisis that causes the people to fear life and to know that life is suffering and to have this thing thrown in their face day after day or not even day after day, maybe year after year, or just knowing that it's hiding and waiting and prevents you from expanding your horizons. You have to look within your community and work together. And what happens is when the dragon gets slain in The Hobbit, you get the dragon's disease that impacts the party that killed them, that killed the dragon. And now it is what happens next. And so while this is all going on, the dwarves are hiding inside their kingdom and they're dealing with this mental anxiety that comes with having all of this gold and all of this abundance. And they become misers and, well, especially the king, whose name I forget right now, suffers deeply after killing this dragon until eventually he's confronted with the reality that there's another dragon at the gates and that's the five armies that are coming to reclaim this kingdom from him yeah and so you can really make a story of what happens after the dragon dies because when the dragon dies it doesn't disappear from the world there's always going to be darkness and it's knowing that there's a dragon to slay every day when you talk about a social individual there's something inside us that's festering in this dark. And when someone says, oh, I'm not mean, I'm not angry, I'm not bitter, I don't care, that's what worries me the most is because they don't even know about the dragon. Yeah, I think that's what Nietzsche was talking about when he was talking about the death of God. I'm like, okay, here we go. We've done it, everyone. We killed God. Now what? What dragon are we going to bow to now? What dragon are we going to fight? Oh, exactly. And I think if, just to spur on that God notion, I just started watching American Gods this week on Amazon Prime Video. Oh, nice. I just bought the book. I haven't read, I haven't watched the series yet, but I just bought the book. I'm certain the book is significantly better than the series, so you may I, be on the I, right I, I love Neil Gaiman, dude. He's one of my favorite writers. Honestly, I can't get enough of him. I don't think I've read any of his works, quite frankly. Um, but the series talks about these new gods. So you have the Twitter god and the, the World Wide Web god and the TV god, and they're warring with the old gods, and the old gods are saying, look, you're not giving these people anything. You're just distracting them. We come from a time where you prayed and you were rewarded, and we gave you purpose and meaning, and if you forgot about us, we reminded you and we made you suffer until you needed us so that we made your life better. And the whole notion of these old gods having purpose and meaning versus these new gods of the internet gods having distraction and just completely destroying what it means to be a human, an individual that worships. It's just a really interesting take on the whole scene of gods. Yeah, Neil Gaiman does a lot of work with the trickster archetype I've noticed in his writing. Oh, absolutely. He clearly loves the tricksters yeah. and i think the tricksters are, are the most powerful lesson teachers around like they've been in native culture for thousands of years 100 percent. i just finished neil gaiman's uh i guess retelling of the old norse stories and loki in that book is the main character really and that's that's his guy dude that's interesting i'll have to check him out and i think just to go back to Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand, I'm really going to end up pursuing um, the acquisition of all these other books that she's written on her philosophical objectivism because, you know, I like where this book is taking me and I'd like to see where it took her and what she wrote about objectivism and the notion that perhaps there may be, yes, indeed, many ways to live, but that only a select few of them are right and good and lead to happiness, health, and wealth. Yeah. I don't think she makes the point that, you know, objectivism is the only way, but I think it's a valuable filter. That's what I would say. 
Have you read some of her other works? Not specifically, but <laughs> all I really know about Ayn Rand is that Neil Peart of Rush basically wrote an album and a half based solely on Ayn Rand's book Anthem. So if you listen to 2112 Overture all the way through, it's this like dystopian story of people who have left behind their own ambitions and a corrupted well, authoritarian group just controlling people and limiting music I definitely haven't like read that. Anthem or Fountainhead again I would like to purchase some of those but more of her actual like scientific writings because all I can tell you about objectivism is what Wikipedia digests it down to which is the the quote from Rand which is uh, objectivism is the concept of man as a heroic being with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life with productive achievement as his noblest activity and reason as his only absolute. So just to unpack that a bit, I think what objectivism means to me is that again, there's many ways to live and there's perhaps only a few right ways to live and that the man, if you take one individual and then compare him to another, those right ways to live may be completely contextually different for each other. Because when you look at it, it says, okay, you're a heroic being and your moral purpose of life is to be happy. And the noblest activity you can do is productive achievement. And the only absolute in life is reason. So when you look inside the consciousness and you say, are you being reasonable? Do you think that you're doing the right thing? Are you on the right track? What is it that you need to do most that you won't think about today because you're avoiding it and you've been avoiding it for 10 years most people have those answers and they're not living their best life but if they reasoned with themselves and won that fight and woke up in the morning didn't look at their phone jumped in the shower went for a walk had a workout got to work did good work and then got home and continued to spread joy and love and do the things that they knew they needed to do instead of going to the peace pipe or the mescal or the alcohol or the clubs or the porn or whatever their vice is that they'd live a happy life with productive achievement. And maybe that's me being um, eccentric and high hoped, but I think most men, most women, most people know what it is they need to be doing and they are so far from that goal. Yeah. I think I agree with everything you just said. Haha, <laughs> e high five. Is there anything we want to wrap up with on on the notes of and it's fun because we're talking about Atlas Shrugged and we're looking at these individuals and we're talking about objectivism and it all t ties full circle with our other chats on the dialogues of Socrates and the discussion of temperance because that's that's the point, right? To be temperate, to do good, to achieve production, to be happy, to live your best life. Like, that's really why we're doing what we're doing, you and I talking. This isn't for anyone, and hopefully it is for those that want it. But for you and me, this discussion, for me specifically, is accountability. And it's, it's a compass for me to tune myself to what it is that I feel I ought to be doing. And I think this is really good content that we're producing. Even if no one ever watched this, at the end of the day, I think I will put more hours in to the things I wanted to do because of these discussions. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been getting a lot out of this whole book wave thing ever since we started. Ever since it started as just a, a book club in the Akira the Dawn server. Shout out. <laughs> golden days. Oh, the golden days. You remember those folks? Shout out to all those folks that came and went. <laughs> oh, the book club of yesteryear. Let's wrap it up here, and then we'll continue this discussion offline. Yeah. Maybe at that point we'll know the question. We'll know the answer to the question, who is John Galt? That is the perfect end note. Who is John Galt? Who is John Galt? Yeah, that's a good end point, Will. All right. Thanks, Rugmo. May the force be with you. And also with you.